it's the 22nd of July. I've been away for several days. I haven't been feeling well. Thank you for your patience and waiting for me to return to reading to you The Reaper and the Scribe, Chapter 68. The Day of Judgment dawned on the plane of existence. Gavin and Sarah Jackson woke early from their slumber with no trepidation for the oncoming fight. Dixie and Paul Johnson also stirred as the sun burst through the open curtains of their bedroom window, both of them knowing what lie ahead for them on that day. Atkinson lay in bed as he observed Tamara through the open bedroom door as she showered. He had watched this beautiful woman bathe, dress, and undress over countless centuries and had never grown tired of the wonderful show. She walked into the bedroom, water dripping from her hair. Are you enjoying the show, Mr. Atkinson? She said impishly. Indeed I am. I'm waiting for the second act, he replied. The second act will follow later. We have business to attend to, she answered, as she wrapped a towel round her naked body. I'm beginning to hate this Crawshaw character, he said. Good, that will help you think like him. I don't have to think like him. His thoughts are now passing to me through Gavin. You mean the mind link is still open? Yes, I have been monitoring Crawshaw all night. How long will the mind fix stay open? As long as it goes undetected. If Crawshaw realizes what is happening, he will send all manner of confusing information, and we will lose our fix on his position. Let's hope he doesn't find out in that case. <laughs> That's like hoping he will keep all the souls within him. It would be nice, but very unlikely. As soon as he realizes that Gavin is out of the coma, he will cut the link, said Atkinson, as he got out of bed and walked to the shower. Gavin and Sarah were now up both of them in their luxury penthouse double shower. As Gavin gently washed her back, he noticed her tattoo at the top of her arm and the thin gold line passing through it. He remembered the first time it had glowed, heralding Dewhurst's visit and how his badly distressed leg became as new. He kissed the back of her neck and realized what a lucky man he was. He'd married the funniest, strongest woman he knew. She could change from the strange little slab girl to the magnificent and all-powerful earth warrior who feared nothing from any realm, from the plane of existence to the dark realm. She was beautiful and quirky. She had a simplicity about herself, yet was so complicated. If ever there was a contradiction in terms, it was his precious wife and comrade in arms, both of whom were his and his alone. This knowledge was where the sentinel's strength came from, for there is no power greater than love. And both of these people poured oceans 
of this wondrous power over one another. Dixie Zever was up and dressed first. Paul Johnson was lagging behind as he came back from the shower, frantically drying his hair with a towel. Dixie laughed and said, We do have elementals that will do that for you. It saves an awful lot of time, you know. I'm quite capable of drying my hair. Thank you very much. How come you use the elementals for more or less everything? asked Paul. You would understand better if you knew what I used to do before I met you, she answered. Why? What did you do? I've always wanted to ask you that. I was, and I suppose still am, an elemental. My tasks were looking after higher beings. I was never allowed to see them, nor have the opportunity to be a personal groomer, although, like all of my kind, I used to dream of being a personal elemental to the list-maker. Her beauty was and is legendary. We all used to muse upon what she would look like and what it would be like to serve her. Of course, the odds against reaching that dizzy high were the same, let's say, as winning the lottery every week for a year. My job was cleaning and washing, and at all times I had to be kept out of sight. If seen by one of the immortals, it meant instant dispatch. Why do you never use the word death? asked Johnson. Only the reaper and powerful immortals are allowed to use that word. Why? Because it is a sacred word, and to use it is to accept your own, she answered. I can see why you're enjoying life now, said Johnson. My life is unbelievable. I have you and all this power within me. Nothing ties me down any more. Speaking of tying down, or should I say up, Mr. Johnson, I don't think think we should be pondering such things today. We have to keep our minds clear for the task ahead. Paul Johnson had a little giggle and said, I didn't mean now. What I was going to say was, when this is all over, I will have to tie you to a tree, naked. Won't you be cold? she asked a cheeky smile adorning her face. Very funny, said Johnson, but I will have to tie you to a tree in the woods, he continued. Oh, do go on. What then? Well, I'll leave you there to be found by the police. I was enjoying it up to that point, she answered. In the realm of death, John Smith was enduring the longest spell any reaper had dealt with within its solitude. He had spent time in the realm of death whilst guarding Atkinson's apparition, but this was different. Whilst carrying on with the day-to-day -day cycle of reaping and sowing, he was also holding on to the souls removed from Crawshaw's grasp. These were the souls of murderers and unrepentant criminals, destined for the defunct dark realm that was soon to be dispatched to nature. The solitude had no effect on Smith as a reaper. 
because he had lived so long on the plane of existence within abject solitude as Atkinson's surrogate. In fact, he found the realm of death rather comforting in a strange way. He felt a sense of purpose as he took a soul from an old, worn-out body and gave it new energy in the birth of a newborn child. Yes, John Smith was enjoying his long spell of reaping because he had time to think in its deep solitude, and the thoughts in his head were of a certain young man working in the pathology department at the hospital. He also wondered what Tom Harper would think if he ever found out that his new love was indeed the Grim Reaper. He pondered upon the thought of what Tamara would think of him, using his time within the realm of death to think about Tom. Tom Harper was in a much better mood that morning, because the pressure of running the department alone during a very busy time was at an end. He was so pleased to see Gavin Jackson and his macabre wife walk into the pathology lab. "'Am I glad to see you, Gavin?' exclaimed Tom. "'I'm glad to be back, Tom. Sarah has told me how busy you've been.' We have. Thankfully, we didn't have to check all the unfortunate people from the bridge suicide. Yes, that would have made for an awful lot of work. Were the deaths drownings, or were there variations? asked Gavin. The odd bruise or two from the fall off the bridge, but apart from that, everyone that fell over the bridge died by drowning, said Tom. Apart from the ones who got out of the water, remarked Gavin Jackson, as he tried to hide the fact that he knew everything that had happened on the bridge, even though he had been in a coma at the time. That's just it. No one got out of the water. They must have just drowned where they fell. That was the reason for the death-by-suicide statement that came from the police, because many of them could still be seen alive in the water, but they made no attempt to get out. It was almost as if something was guiding them to that end, said Tom. Okay, well... I'll leave you with Sarah so that I can catch up on my paperwork, said Gavin, as he walked away to his office. And what, pray tell, are those things on your legs, madam, said Tom, as he stared in disbelief at Sarah. My trousers, answered Sarah. All I can see is your legs. Trousers are not supposed to be ripped all the way up the front. Sarah swished around, and Tom nearly fainted. Yeah, they are the same at the back. I can see your bum cheeks. I have a nice little bum. Gavin says that all the time, said Sarah, smiling. That is as may be, but do you think this is the place to have it on display? asked Tom. It won't be on display when I have my white coat on, will it? she said, mm, pfft, sticking her tongue out at him. You drive me to despair. Just make sure it's fully buttoned up, lady. Sarah disappeared into the locker room and returned, wearing her fully buttoned white coat, the largest pair of thick rubber gloves he'd ever seen, a surgical face mask, and a pair of goggles. 
How do I look now? She said. Perfect. Just stay like that. It's a definite improvement. By the way, what time is it? <gasps> I know. It's tea making time. Off you trot then, you little minx. Put yourself to good use. Just as that particular conversation was taking place, Detective Superintendent Victoria Malik came into the room. Hello, Vic. I mean, hello, Detective Superintendent Malik. How can I be a service? asked Tom. Victoria showed a small grin as she looked at a very posh sounding Tom Harper and the bane of his working life, who looked as if she had just come in from the set of an old Hammer horror film. Do excuse whatever that is. She's just leaving, said Tom, pushing Sarah towards the canteen. I'm going to make some tea, said Sarah. Then be gone with you, said Tom. Sarah turned and walked out, humming the death march. Tom just shook his head, rolling his eyes. <laughs> Never a dull moment, eh? said Victoria as she gave him a wink. So, is this business a pleasure? asked Tom. Both, but business first. Is Gavin Jackson back yet? Yes, he is. Would you like to see him? He is up to speed on everything that has happened on the bridge. Yes, I would, please. And the pleasure? queried Tom. Would you and your little accountant fancy a night in the show bar with your gorgeous sister and me? My little accountant, as you call him, has not been answering his phone, and his secretary told me he is out of town for a day or two on business, so I can't answer for him as yet, but I'm certainly up for it. As soon as he's back in touch, I'll give you a ring, promised Tom. It's a date, then, replied Vic. Tom showed her to Gavin's office. After the pleasantries had been exchanged, Detective Superintendent Malik said, Now that everything is cleared up and all your tests have been done, can you throw any light on to why, after jumping over the low bridge into the water, none of them changed their minds and got out? In my experience with suicide, many people change their minds. And the law of averages says that some of that large crowd would have done so. I don't think the law of averages comes into this. You speak of experience. May I ask, are you basing this experience on singular suicides? asked Jackson. Oh, well, yes, thankfully. We are not overrun by mass suicides in this town. Just as I thought. Mass suicide is totally different to a person who just can't take any more and decides to end it all. These are cult followers, people who are under the influence of of a very strong personality. You seem quite knowledgeable on this subject. It is a subject I studied quite intensely. Can I offer you a drink, Superintendent? No, thank you. So you are saying one person could be behind all of this? Almost certainly. The more I look into this, the more one person's name keeps cropping up in my head. But it can't be. He is a chief inspector in the police force, 
interrupted Gavin. Whatever makes you say that? I am a friend of both the lady who is missing and her partner, Paul Johnson. What has he been saying about it? Uh, he is still too much of a good policeman to cast wayward aspersions about anyone. The thing is, I was in the man's office when he saw Crawshaw manhandle his fiance into the woods after he had coerced her into many meetings as she tried to infiltrate the actions of Atkinson, Dewhursts, and Smith. We have to catch this guy, said Malik as she stood up and bid her farewells. Sarah came into the office with her husband's tea, and Gavin said, I think we will soon be rid of this troublesome police officer. In the cold, damp mill on the south side of the river, a voice rang out. Where is the son of my jailer? growled Crawshaw. The rats just twitched their noses with no real concern for their master's question. He reached into the sleeping mind of Gavin Jackson with the same question, but to his horror, he found the sentinel wide awake. The question bounced back at him with an answer. You will know soon enough. Immediately, Crawshaw canceled the mind link and stood up, displacing several rats from the floor with a kick of his boot. The action that followed was twofold. He had placed a certain amount of trepidation into Crawshaw, as he knew his position might be compromised. It also totally freed the sentinel from any further interference from Crawshaw. Crawshaw pointed at one of the nearby rats, releasing a captive soul from within. The rat instantly became humanoid. The creature walked up to Crawshaw, its neck still broken from a hangman's noose. I have the blood of a rat running through my veins. Better free with rat's blood than be encaged in that old realm. Now get out of my face before I put you back there, screamed Crawshaw as he punched his soldier square in the face, sending him sprawling into the other rats. He began pointing at other rats, gifting them with murderous souls, all bent on revenge and destruction, but with no voice. The old mill was filling up with murderers, rapists, and the dregs of ancient humans long since dispatched to the dark realm. Crawshaw looked upon his army and declared that very soon the plane of existence would be theirs for the taking. In unison, they each raised their arms in the air, with their clothes withered and torn, most of them with broken necks or horrendous burns from the electric chair, none of them able to talk. All they could muster were moans of pain. They looked like the beginnings of a zombie apocalypse. Crawshaw surveyed his army of the dead and was ready to face his adversary. 
in the other realm, Atkinson called upon Sarah, Gavin, and Dixie, all of whom appeared in front of him in battle dress, swords in hand. Now that Crawshaw has released Gavin from his mind, he will be aware that we know his whereabouts, which will mean the souls will no longer be within him. This will prove both troublesome and advantageous, he instructed. In what way advantageous, said Gavin, now that he is separated, his strength is diminished in this realm. He is only so bold because of the strength he felt whilst he was intact with the other souls. The police can deal with him when he shoots. Well, let's not worry too much about Crawshaw. Sarah and Dixie both looked at Atkinson. Who will be shot? asked Sarah. <clears throat> As I said, let's not worry about that, as it has no effect on what we are doing. Sarah took out a small stone and began sharpening her sword, saying, Be careful who you sacrifice, Atkinson. Gavin and Atkinson both looked at the warrior with the cold steel in her eyes. She bore no resemblance to Slab Girl as she deftly sharpened her weapon of choice. Dixie, who could not challenge anything Atkinson said, looked on, but she bore the same fear of losing someone that Sarah did. Atkinson calmed the situation down by saying, Can we sort this out without the human emotions, please? We all have a job to do. Dixie hung her head. Sarah just kept sharpening her sword. At exactly 2200 hours, we attack the mill. Now, I must brief Johnson on his role in this battle. With that, Atkinson left the warriors with Dewhurst. Paul Johnson was sitting at his desk, watching the seconds pass, when Atkinson materialized in the chair in front of the ex-chief police inspector. If I had been drinking tea, it would be all over you now, said Johnson, with his pulse racing. You must get used to my untimely entrances, answered Atkinson. Can't you materialize at the other side of the door and announce yourself? It'd certainly help my blood pressure. Your blood pressure is fine. You have arranged for a police presence at the old mill tonight? I have. Detective Superintendent Malik will be there with a large police presence. Does the superintendent know the whereabouts and the time? I have told her I will give her both at 2130 hours. Good man! I want you and the police there at 2200, not a second late or earlier. Is that understood? Clear as day, said Johnson. In that case, I will leave this in your capable hands, just so you don't jump. I'm leaving now, said Atkinson, as he disappeared. He reappeared in front of Tamara's desk. The list maker was buffing her already beautifully manicured nails. Well, my day just improved, quipped Tamara. 
The sight of you always brightens my day, he smiled. Judging by your armor, you haven't come here to rid me of my clothing and do all manner of unmentionable things to me across my desk, she said. Alas, tomorrow, no, I need a link to Smith. As you know, he is in the realm of death, said Tamara, and that is precisely why I need you, he advised. You want to talk to him through me? Yes. Well, you're the boss, but I must say, this is most uncomfortable. I had to do it once with your father in Dewhurst. Why is everybody whining today? said Atkinson. Tamara just raised an eyebrow and said, mm, Come and get me, tiger. Atkinson smiled and said, You're such a trollop. You'd better believe it, she answered. Atkinson sat behind her, placing his hands at the sides of her head and then concentrating on Smith. I'm a little busy right now, Tamara, is what came through. It's Atkinson. We need to talk. Fire away. Not like this. Come to the door. Seconds later, the great door at the back of the office opened with the familiar creak, and Smith walked in. What's going on? inquired the reaper. Everything is in place, but it isn't going to be as straightforward anymore. Why? Crawshaw has split from the souls. I see. So what do we do now? Instead of me sending them to you in one lot, it will be four of us sending them in smaller lots. Are you okay with that? Hey, I don't mind how they come to me. I just need to know what time they will start arriving. Are they in human bodies? They will start arriving at 2200 hours, GMT, but they have taken the bodies of rats. I can't reap rats, said Smith. Normally that is the case, but this is different. It is just the soul that holds our interest. As soon as you have the individual soul, you will store it with the ones you already have by tying the cord and not severing it. Once you have that soul, think Dewhurst, and he will pass the rat's life force on to the correct reaper. All right, that all sounds fair enough. I'll go back now and prepare for what's to come. Good man, said Atkinson. Before you go, John, I have a message from Tom Harper. He wants to know if you are available to go out to the show bar with him, his sister and her partner, said Tamara. That sounds brilliant. After spending all this time in the realm of death, answer yes for me, please. With that, he turned the great door and returned to his work. So, we are about to go into battle, and you are arranging dates for the Reaper. Life goes on. We can't let a little apocalyptic threat get in the way of true love now, can we? Atkinson just smiled at Tamara and blew her a kiss, saying, It begins at 2200. Be ready, just in case. I'm always ready, was Tamara's answer. Atkinson disappeared, rejoining his warriors.
Paul Johnson picked up his phone and rang Victoria Malik. When she answered, he said, I have the details you need for tonight's raid. Where and when, Paul? The old disused mill just south of Leeds Lock at precisely 2200 hours, not a second before or a second after, said Johnson. That's not much in the way of tolerance, said Malik. That's as may be, but it is the tolerance you will have to work to, he answered. Okay, 2200 hours it is. I will meet you at the main doorway. I think it would be better if you left it to the police, answered the detective superintendent. I can't leave anything to chance. Things must be done exactly, and I know exactly what you guys have to do. You want to get this guy, don't you? Okay, I suppose this is a somewhat unusual case. I will meet you at the entrance to the mill. With that, she bid him goodbye and began organizing her team of officers who would carry out that night's raid. Paul Johnson put the phone down and left his office. He knocked on John Smith's door and walked in. Hello, Paul, said Tamara. Hi, Tamara. Yes, she is, said Tamara. What? he answered. You were just about to ask me if Dixie is capable of what she is about to do. Yeah, actually I was. She, along with Sarah and Gavin, is a powerful force. And don't forget who will be fighting alongside them. Yes, I know all this, and I understand the Reaper, a scribe, and a list maker must stay in situ, but why is it me and not Dixie? interrupted Tamara. Well, yes, this is Dixie's first administration with the Reaper. Her experience is very limited. She has never worked with a different type of reaper and doesn't have a full understanding of the job. I, on the other hand, do. It is that simple, Paul. But Atkinson is far more experienced than John Smith. Yes, he is. And we are going over the same stuff as we did before. It's down to this Paul, only four beings have a slim chance of killing Atkinson. One is his partner, Dewhurst. Another is Mother Nature, and as long as he is doing her a favor by bending the rules to send the reaped souls to her, I think he is quite safe to have a little fun. Fun? Is that what you call it? To Atkinson, rendering the dark realm asunder will be him laying the last thing that binds him to his father to rest. He can then get on with a much greater challenge. You said four beings. Yes, I did. But I don't see Gavin or Sarah turning on him, do you? I see. So can you guarantee that Dixie will be safe? There are no guarantees in this line of work, Paul. You might not survive this day yourself. I thought we were all immortal. Yes, Paul, we are but only in the fact that we do not have a mortal cord and a life number ticking downwards 
If struck by the right weapon, we will fall. But Atkinson will bring you back to life, like he did before. That would depend upon the weapons they have perfected in that miserable realm. Weapons made from hate are never good weapons, Paul. Paul Johnson bid Tamara good day and left the office. In the old mill, just south of Leeds Lock, Crawshaw rallied his troops. The tormented souls using the life force of rats in human form all hung upon his every word. We will first kill all the Creator's soldiers. Then we will kill Atkinson, the son of the Creator. When that small task is complete, we will ravage the earth and find the creature known as Paladin. He will now be beyond turning to our way of thinking, so he will be put to the sword as well. Are you all with me? He screamed out. Moans of agreement came from the mischief of humanoid rats. As night began to fall, Paladin and Juliantrium drove to their position in the woods. Mother Nature had prepared a holding cell in the far corner of her domain, ready to receive the souls from Paladin. John Smith had finished his shift of cutting the normal cords he had to deal with, and was awaiting the first of the dark souls to pass through his realm of death. Johnson placed a loaded revolver in his shoulder holster and made his way to the rendezvous point. Tamara was waiting to pass telepathically from Smith the life force of the rats to the reaper of their rightful reaper system for regeneration via Dewhurst. Chief Superintendent Victoria Malik and her police team were parked 300 yards up the road from the mill, ready to activate at 2200 hours. Atkinson, Sarah, Gavin, and Dixie all drew their swords as the hour approached, then disappeared from within their realm. The town hall clock rang out ten resonating bells as Atkinson's warriors reappeared in the mill. Mother Nature and John Smith opened a channel to Paladin, and Victoria Malik and Paul Johnson, with the help of the police, charged at the door. Atkinson! screamed Crawshaw as he took his revolver from its holster and fired off three rounds straight at him. Atkinson instantaneously snapped his fingers, and he, his warriors, and the army of rat humans were transported to the other realm, leaving Crawshaw where he stood, the gun in his hand still smoking. The very second this happened, the police burst in, and the three bullets with Atkinson's name on them embedded into Paul Johnson's chest. The ex-policeman was catapulted back through the open door 
and lay in agony as he bled on the steps. Arrest that man! shouted Superintendent Malik. Her officers rushed to Crawshaw and restrained him. The entity within him left his body, passing through the police officers and into the wall. It was now without a life force and without its army of souls, all of which were now battling in the other realm. Sergeant Glenn Simpson was the first to reach Paul Johnson as he lay dying on the steps of the mill. He had called for an ambulance just as Victoria Malik arrived at his side. How is he? she asked. He's unconscious, and I can't stop the bleeding, said Simpson. Inside the mill, Chief Inspector Crawshaw stood, dazed, confused, and handcuffed. What is happening? he asked. I am arresting you on three, possibly five, counts of murder, attempted murder, suspicion of abduction, falsifying evidence, and for your involvement in the mass suicide at the bridge. I caution you that anything you say will be written down and may be used in evidence against you said a solemn police officer. Murder? Attempted murder? What are you talking about, fool? said Crawshaw, regaining his senses somewhat. The murder of three officers at the police station on Park Road. Unconfirmed reports of the murder of Miss Dixie Atkinson, the secretary at Atkinson, Dewhurst and Smith, and by the looks of him, as he left in the ambulance just now, the murder of ex-Chief Inspector Paul Johnson. Also, the attempted murder of Detective Chief Superintendent Victoria Malik, said the arresting officer. Victoria Malik walked up to Crawshaw, looked him straight in the eye, and said, Take this piece of shit away! Chief Inspector William Crawshaw had been read his rights and was taken away to the police station to await an appearance in front of a judge. The dark souls from inside the old mill had materialized in a specially prepared area of the other realm. At one end stood the disorganized, leaderless army of the dark realm. At the other end, Atkinson, Sarah, Gavin, and Dixie stood with their swords drawn and a single-minded intention for what was ahead of them. The dark army realized they didn't need a leader as their enemies consisted of only four giants they were thousands strong, albeit each one of them was only three or four feet tall. In total disarray, the dark hordes charged at the four giants. Atkinson shouted, Sarah, to my left! Dixie, to my right! Sentinel, you have my back! Are we ready? The words, I, came from his three warriors as the rat humanoids encircled them. Everyone, take two steps forward to give yourself space to work in, instructed Atkinson, the warrior general. Atkinson, via Tamara, linked his mind with the reaper. The reaper's mind linked with Paladin, 
via Tamara. Tamara's mind linked with the Dewhursts. Paladin's mind linked with Mother Nature. And Dewhurst's mind linked with Tamara and the Reaper of Rodentia. Everything was in place as the rat folk charged from all four directions. On the plane of existence, the ambulance screeched to a halt outside of the hospital, and the paramedics rushed Paul Johnson inside. He was taken straight to the awaiting operating theater, where the surgeon was already in situ. Let's have him on here, said the eminent surgeon, Mr. Marcus Grant Thomas, B.S.F.R.C.S. What do we have here, chaps? He continued. Three bullet wounds to the chest. The patient has severe bradycardia. B.P. 70 over 40. Okay, boys and girls, we gotta move fast, or we will lose him before we start. In the other realm, the battle began, with the first of the dark army reaching the four mighty warriors. Heads, arms, legs, torsos were flying everywhere as the mighty blades of Atkinson's warriors tore through the waves of rat humans. The fear of weapons that Atkinson warned about proved to be unfounded. The Dark Realm had not produced any weapons at all. But there was a problem. As each dark soul was put to death, it seemed two more were taking its place. It was as if the portal was still open from that doomed realm, and more were streaming in. The sheer volume of rat folk was becoming problematic. Sarah's sword was unrelenting, simply swishing from side to side with no need of thrusting. The individual entities had no answers, but the volume of them was beginning to ask questions. The sentinel stood strong, his strokes as strong as his wife's, disemboweling and beheading everything that came near his blade. Dixie held her flank with determined and telling sword work, her concentration transfixed on the job at hand. Atkinson stood solid and well in control of the situation, his blade leaving a trail of blood with its every cross and return. In the realm of death, John Smith was tying and severing cords at breakneck speed of every creature that was passing through his realm without even breaking into a sweat. Paladin was transferring the dark souls through the portal to Mother Nature and the rats through Tamara to Dewhurst, who passed them then to their reaper. Dewhurst noticed the large volumes of numbers being mentally passed around. He took advantage of the fact that he could hold time in the great room so he could check on Atkinson. He materialized in the wings of the battle taking place and saw the problem. He knew he had to stop the hordes from coming through, but he also knew he couldn't leave any. With a wave of his hand, he changed into warrior mode and demanded every elemental within their realm to take arms against their undiminishing foes. Back at police headquarters, Detective Superintendent Victoria Malik 
and the rest of her team were in a debriefing, with Crawshaw safely locked up in a cell. It was time for the thin blue line to congratulate itself on a job well done. There will be a lot of people, both in and out of the police force, who will be glad to see the back of Chief Inspector Crawshaw, me in particular. There is no room in the modern police force for individuals like him. We need more people like poor Mr. Johnson and less of the likes of who replaced him. When all this has died down, I am going to personally root out as many homophobic, racist individuals from this police force as I can, said Victoria. The entire room of police officers cheered, with the exception of one, police officer Linda Harper, who just wanted to get her girlfriend home to begin their life together. The battle raged on, all four warriors now drenched in the blood of their foes, and that blood flowing in every direction like a river away from them. The ever-growing mound of corpses made it harder for them to see, but also it was slowing down their opponent's rush towards them. Atkinson noticed he was beginning to see that a gap was starting to form at the back of the battlefield as Dewhurst's elementals began attacking the new arrivals. Hundreds of elementals were laying waste to thousands of rats infested with dark souls. Confident that his elementals were doing their job, Dewhurst left this area and headed for the plane of existence. A somber quiet fell amongst the medical staff on hand in the operating theater as the surgeon finally stated the time and pronounced that ex-chief inspector Paul Johnson was dead. A shadowy figure walked through Clive Thompson, the anesthetist, and Wendy Walters, the theater nurse, to Johnson's side and touched his wounds. Instantly, the beeps and buzzes were activated again as the startled team of medics looked on in disbelief. Upon hearing the sounds, the surgeon looked back, then ran to the table. His BP is 120 over 60, and his pulse is 70 BPM. Impossible, said Marcus Grant Thomas. The man's dead. It's not a mistake. Just look at his chest. You can see him breathing gasped Wendy Walters, the theater sister. Well, let's get the last of these bullets out. Come on, guys, exclaimed the surgeon. Dewhurst smiled and returned to the other realm and his desk, and the transferences began again. In the realm of nature, the holding area was filling up, but instead of filling up with hateful souls, it was beginning to overflow with a powerful energy that brought hope for the future of the planet. All the tormented souls passing through every part of this reaping process were cleansed, and as they journeyed from Atkinson and his warrior's swords to Smith in the realm of death, then onto Paladin on the plane of existence. 
the souls lost some of their negativity at each stage of the process. Finally, each soul passed through the cleansing portal into the realm of nature as pure earth energy and was accepted into the holding area by Mother Nature herself. Within the other realm, Dewhurst's elementals had slain thousands of dark souls as the battle-weary warriors were dispatching the last few hundred to Smith, who in turn dispatched them to Paladin and to Mara. Dewhurst was now sitting back in his chair, dispatching the rats to their reaper, who hadn't worked this hard in years, as there were only a few dark souls left in front of Atkinson, his three warriors came and stood at his side. All four were breathing heavily, covered head to toe in blood. Atkinson looked to his left at Sarah and Dixie, then to his right at Gavin, his sentinel. He grinned, and to the sound of CHARGE! All four screamed their ancient war cries. Swords forward. They ran at the last hundred or so dark souls, dispatching them in seconds with relative ease. With the battle won, the four bloodied warriors were now the only ones standing as the elementals returned to their duties. The battlefield was awash with bodies and blood. Atkinson drove his mighty sword into the ground. A ring of flames burst outwards across the devastation of that part of his very own realm, instantly setting fire to all the bodies that lay at the warrior's feet. As the flames ravaged the deceased residents of the Dark Realm, Atkinson, Sarah, Dixie, and Gavin walked through the fire and the flames and emerged clean and refreshed just outside Dewhurst's ornate doorway. Well done, everyone, congratulated Dewhurst. Thank you. For your timely intervention, answered Atkinson. Sarah was arm in arm with Gavin. Another battle over. Another battle won. Dewhurst looked at Dixie and said, Go to your man. Dixie bowed her head, looked at her friends, and then depressed Paul Johnson's button on her phone. She was shocked to materialize in the hospital and in intensive care. Paul Johnson was lying on the bed asleep. My darling, what has happened? exclaimed Dixie. Paul Johnson woke and said, I had a bad day at the office, dear. How did yours go? It was bloody awful. Well, not really. But it was bloody. How did you end up in here? Our chief inspector shot three rounds in my chest. Why did he shoot you? He didn't. He shot at Atkinson. But as you guys left the party... The bullets with his name on them hit me three times. It's a wonder it didn't kill you, said Dixie. Oh, it did. But our Mr. Dewhurst came along and said hello. The next thing I knew, I was in this bed <laughs> as alive as ever.
Dixie leaned down and kissed him on his forehead, saying, It's all over now, my darling. The dark realm is no more. We can get back to arranging our wedding. Yep, we don't want our son to be born out of wedlock, do we? He said, Our daughter will be born, whether we are married or not. She cannot be judged by a simple piece of paper. The true love and care bestowed upon her by her parents are what she needs. At last, you are pregnant then. I had to be shot before you would finally tell me, he quipped. Dixie just giggled and said, Of course I am. Why do you think Atkinson sent us to that tropical island? Oh, I thought it was for a well-deserved break. Oh, my love. Atkinson always has an ulterior motive. It was to produce Paladin's ocean counterpart, the Maiden of the Sea. Maiden of the, the sea, he repeated. Yes, my love, finally the world will have balance. Aquilia will be the water element. Paladin is the earth element. Mother Nature is the air that we breathe. And Atkinson is the rejuvenating fire which purges. You see, Paul, the earth will once again have elemental balance, so we will be able to put things right, unlike when Atkinson's father ruled supreme, and anger, greed, and war flourished. <clears throat> I take it we will need a house by the sea, then, said Johnson, Dewhurst is already having it built whilst we wait for the child's arrival. Whew, it's good to be an immortal, said Johnson, as the nurse came in and explained to Dixie visiting time had ended hours ago. In the realm of nature, Paladin, astride Juliantrium, trotted up to Mother Nature, who was standing and admiring her new acquisition. A brilliant team effort, Paladin. It is the first time in many millennia that the three realms have worked together. The outcome was better than even I had anticipated. I feel reborn, and for the first time in a long time, I think I can trust an Atkinson again. Today's events have proven to be a great day for humanity. It is a shame. They don't know anything about it, enthused Mother Nature. I feel strange, said Paladin. That is because your time is nigh, said Nature. My time? Yes, Paladin. You will become Atkinson's apprentice, and with me... Working my magic upon the earth, you will learn from him how the humans live and die. You will learn their strengths and weaknesses, and he will show you your path, and to what end you will use your powers. When will this be? Within the next twelve moons said Mother Nature cryptically, as she turned once more to survey her cache of raw pay.
power. In the other realm, Gavin and Sarah bid Atkinson and Dewhurst farewell for the time being as they both returned to their penthouse apartment overlooking the city center. Alice was there to welcome them in from work, saying, I have cooked dinner tonight, and there is a bottle of wine waiting for you in the lounge. Sarah and Gavin stood on the balcony in each other's arms, looking at the night sky. Although they lived in the north of England, they were treated to a beautiful display of the northern lights, not the street lights. This was the aurora borealis right there over Leeds. Gavin whispered into Sarah's ear, I think Mother Nature must be pleased. John Smith came from the realm of death after his mammoth shift and said, Hi, honey, I'm home. Tamara greeted him and said, Well done, John. You were terrific. The realm of death is in good hands. Now, what do you want to do? Because I have heard there is some fine Napoleon brandy about to be enjoyed and I'm going to make my way there. Ooh, you have a message from Tom Harper on your desk about your night out. Bye, sweetie, she said, blowing him a kiss. Picking up his phone, John Smith called Tom Harper. Hey, Tom, yeah, I'm back from my travels and would love to go out. Do you fancy partying the night away? Because I sure do. Sure. Do you mind if my sister and her new partner come along? Asked Tom. The more, the merrier, answered the Grim Reaper. John Smith and Tom Harper met up with Linda Harper and Victoria Malick outside the viaduct pub and all went inside. Sitting at their table, the two police officers wanted to talk about apprehending a crooked police chief inspector. The mortuary tech didn't want to talk about dissecting body parts, and the accountant thought it prudent not to talk about his day at all. But a great time was had by everyone. All over the world, baby rats were being born at a level never seen before. These rats were all disease-free, ready to flourish in a world which would soon be a better place for their species, as animal testing would have no part in the Earth's imminent bright new future. In the wall of the old mill, just south of Leeds Lock, a shadow diminished into nothingness, and the dark realm truly died. Atkinson and Dewhurst sat in their communal area, drinking a glass of rather fine brandy, from Napoleon's private collection. Where can a lady get a decent drink around here? said the beautiful woman who materialized in front of them. Atkinson and Dewhurst both smiled at her as the two gods in their Valhalla were feeling quite pleased with themselves. A toast! My friends, said Atkinson, pouring Tamara a drink, to new beginnings. To a brilliant team, said Tamara, to Atkinson's apprentice, said Dewhurst. 
What? Said Atkinson and Tamara.